Hello, my name is Ken Weston. I'm a security analyst here with Tripwire. Um, and I want to give a presentation here just to give an introduction into what exactly indicators of compromise are before we get into more detail around threat intelligence because um, really indicators of compromise are really what comprise um, threat intelligence. So, So before we get into the more technical discussion, I wanted to introduce a concept developed by Edmund Lacard. Lacard was one of the founders of forensic science, and many of his concepts and tools are still in use today. He was credited with what is known as Lacard's exchange principle. It states that basically, when it comes to crimes, every contact leaves a trace. Of course, at the time he was dealing specifically with physical crimes, with the idea that when a criminal commits a crime such as murder or burglary, they leave something behind, as well as take something with them from the scene, whether consciously or not. He basically laid the foundation for fingerprints and other forms of evidence, even well before uh, the introduction of DNA-based evidence and, and other um, types of uh, trace evidence. So what exactly does this have to do with uh, cybersecurity and intrusion detection? Well, I believe that Lacard's exchange principle actually applies to cyber investigations as well. Many times after there has been a breach, organizations may say they have no evidence. However, the reality is usually they were not collecting the right data uh, before there was the uh, compromise, or they simply don't know where to look for that information. Many times there is evidence present, but the organization or the investigators uh, may not know where to find it. In my experience, even the smallest fragment of data can actually unveil the source of an intrusion uh, and connect the dots to fully understand the scope of a full compromise. So when we discuss uh, threat intelligence, we often refer to uh, indicators of compromise or what are called IOCs for short. An IOC is essentially a forensic artifact, analogous to fingerprints, uh, murder weapon, um, even DNA and physical crimes. To further categorize the artifacts, we, we further want to break these down into a few different groups. First, we have what are known as atomic IOCs. So atomic IOCs are elements or fragments of data that can't be broken down any further. So things like a host name, an IP address, um, email addresses, uh, file names, uh, process name, for example, or text strings. It could be something like a credit card number or a social security number, um, some sort of fragment of piece of information that is part of an intrusion and, and a breach. Next, we have what are referred to as computed IOCs. So these can be MD5 hash sums of malware, um, statistics, regular expressions. So this is usually something that is uh, it's computed in some fashion. And then we have what are known as behavioral IOCs, which um, can comprise multiple atomic or computed IOCs. So this will actually uh, provide us with a sort of a signature of an attack. And uh, to give you guys an example, we'll go through a story problem and then break it down, and, and you can uh, get a better understanding of how this all works. So let's try to apply these, these IOCs to a real problem. So um, here's our story problem. Um, we're doomed. Our web server has just been hacked. The attacker targeted, um, he used an exploit against us. Uh, they were able to install malware. They installed multiple files, made connections to remote hosts. Uh, we think more files were downloaded and additional scans were actually run on the network. So before we panic, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going we're to break this down. So um, here I created a table. So the first thing we have over here is our behavioral IOC ID. So I'm going to start with this with B1. And we break this down. So the attacker with um, a particular IP, he targets a vulnerable web server um, with an exploit, and he was able to create an admin account called Rootkitty. Um, so we have the atomic um, indicator here of the remote IP address, which I've entered here. Um, we also have the username, which is another atomic um, uh, um, component because it can't be broken down any further. It's a simple username, but it's uh, highly relevant to our investigation. So then we break that down into another behavior um, ID, so we have B2, um, and here we have the attacker installs malware with a particular hash, um, and that gets installed to um, a particular DLL. So here we have the computational um, component, which is an MD5 hash sum that I've listed here. We have another atomic indicator, which is the file uh, name um, badboy.dll. Um, then we move on to our, our B3, which is uh, another case where the malware connects to, to a remote server of a particular IP address. Um, we also have the port. 
So here we have an atomic indicator of the, again, of an IP address, and the port number, of course, is also its own atomic um, indicator. So we have uh, this all listed out, and so on and so forth. So as we actually break down the different attacks, and as we find different pieces of evidence, um, we want to break it down into these different components. Um, and the, the sequence does matter a bit. Um, we'll uh, kind of see how that can uh, play out later. But um, the idea is here is we don't need to panic. We can actually start um, itemizing um, all the pieces of evidence and we can gather it into a spreadsheet or, um, or other tools. So another way we want to break down um, our IOCs are um, based on where we find um, the particular fragments of, of evidence. Um, so first, um, here on the left side, we have um, host-based indicators. So things like regi registry keys, file names, text strings, process names, uh, mutex, uh, file hashes, user accounts, directory paths. So these are all things that we would find directly on the host system itself. Um, and so that's why we want to call those host-based indicators. Next are things we might um, find across the network, so network-based indicators such as an IP address, domain name, um, text string, um, uh, certificate hashes, uh, the communication protocol that's being used, file names and URLs. And oftentimes we'll actually find that there is overlap. For example, we may see that um, in a URL string that there's a credit card or social security number, um, but we can also then map that to um, where we found that on a host-based um, indicator where it was in a file or um, it was in, named in a file of some sort. So um, then we're able to draw a correlation between those two. So the fact that they overlap, that's okay. Um, we just need to make sure that we make a note of that when we're actually writing out um, our incident response reports. So that raises another interesting question is that, you know, we have host-based indicators, we have network-based indicators, uh, but many times um, IOCs can be found in, in many different places. Um, you know, we, you've heard about the Internet of Things. Um, it's, it's almost uh, equivalent uh, with your IOC. It's, they can be at anywhere. They can be in databases. We can find them on um, the hard drive of systems. Um, we can even find them in memory, uh, log files, um, even social media accounts. Uh, many times a hacker might be using a Twitter account to um, exfiltrate data or announce um, that they've compromised a system. Um, and also cloud uh, raises a, a lot of issues. Um, it's, sometimes it's difficult to gather evidence from the cloud, uh, particularly if an instance has been shut down. Um, we can't you know, go out and actually grab um, the disk drive from a cloud-based storage provider. Um, so there are a lot of challenges around um, gathering some of that information. Um, you can gather additional uh, log data and things like that from your cloud services, um, but you need to make sure that that is um, in place before you get breached, of course, to make sure you're gathering enough evidence. Um, even mobile devices, you know, devices that are on laptops, um, you know, with employees, um, configuration settings, um, even within photos and images, there's um, data, be it uh, GPS coordinates, if it comes from a smartphone, or, you know, as I've learned, serial numbers um, as well can be um, embedded in images. Um, that can all be in IOC as well. Um, that can help with an investigation. Um, and of course, you know, any sort of uh, geotagging that takes place, um, be it um, IP geolocation from an IP address, um, geo uh, data we're able to extract from a, uh, a particular image, um, or um, maybe even uh, some information we can get from a binary file um, as to where that actual application actually came from. So when we talk about the gathering of um, some of these uh, these artifacts, you know, they, they increase in difficulty. So um, this was actually um, a, a concept. It was referred to as the, uh, the pyramid of pain by uh, David Bianco, um, who actually developed this concept where, you know, the hash values, those are fairly simple, getting hash values from malware and files, um, IP addresses, domain names, you know, those are fairly trivial to get. Um, it's easy for us to extract and it's easy for us to share that. Um, network and host-based artifacts, that can get a little more complex as we're actually uh, trying to get more information off of the host, um, and those files can be, you know, in multiple locations. Um, and then, of course, then we get into tools, um, and that can be even more difficult to identify what specifically, what tools um, the attacker is using. Uh, we may know the exploit he's using, but, you know, is he using Metasploit or, or what other uh, tools and techniques, uh, which gets into the top level, which is the TTPs, which is the tools, techniques, and procedures. Um, and that's where we, we start to identify the actual attacker, you know, what are their motivations, um, what specifically are the tools and techniques 
techniques that they're using. Um, and those are where we actually start making assumptions um, based on you know, some of the other artifacts. And we start to draw those connections as a result of it. So oftentimes, you know, that's very difficult for us to actually get at. Um, you know, it's easy for us to get a hash value or a malicious IP. Um, but actually identifying the full scope of um, the, the attempted intrusion can be a bit of a challenge. So which brings us into um, you know, something that's a little more, uh, I guess, qualitative in terms of um, threat intelligence is many times different types of organizations, you know, they're, they're targeted by um, different types of groups. So if you're a government or a, a, a defense contractor, an APT may be targeting you, um, and, you know, they're after a particular type of information. Um, uh, bots, you know, if they're uh, maliciously simply scanning your website, um, looking to hijack your system to take advantage of uh, computing resources, uh, you know, script kitty may just be looking to have some fun to deface your website. Um, hacktivists, maybe they, they're looking out to uh, actually cause damage to your systems. Um, and then, of course, we have criminal syndicates, uh, like we've seen with many of the retail breaches lately, uh, where they're actually trying to um, extract uh, credit card information for financial gain. Um, and that's where it really becomes a challenge is, you know, we understand that, you know, these artifacts, IP addresses, things like that, you know, we can see that type of information. But, you know, creating the big picture as to, you know, who's attacking us and why, um, that can be um, one of the big challenges. And there's a lot of organizations such as, you know, financial services, they have their ISACs, where they can actually collaborate and actually share information, which has become increasingly important. And you also have groups like InfraGuard and um, some other um, ISACs will actually exchange and share information. Um, there's even one for retail and, and other industry groups. Um, so they're able to actually show um, information around, you know, who's attacking um, the networks and, and share that intelligence. Um, and not just at the granular level, but also understanding sort of the motivations behind it. And some tools also that they use to help share that information are formats, which are like OpenIOC, which is a really simple XML format, which takes that, uh, that spreadsheet that we created where we actually went through the atomic um, and the computed IOCs and actually applies that into sort of an XML format that can be easily be shared across um, with other organizations. Um, YAR is another similar format that's being used for um, especially um, sharing uh, signatures around malware. Um, Six Cybox and Taxi, um, these are all other formats similar type of open IOC um, to help share some of this information. Um, I even include Snort and Suricata rules here as an example, um, even though they're signature based, um, there's still a way of, of sharing that threat intelligence um, information across with other groups. And then you have um, threat intelligence feeds, which get a little more sophisticated, where um, groups like um, Norris has a, a great feed, Alien Vault, and some other um, companies out there. There's also uh, some open source ones that are available um, that allow you to you know, bring in, in um, information and reputation about IP addresses, um, malware hashes, um, and other information. And of course, then also you have you know, APIs that you can integrate with um, for on the commercial side. Many vendors will actually share some of this intelligence um, for a fee. Um, and not all those, those feeds are equal. Um, some are better than others. Um, and some, sometimes there's overlap and sometimes they're not. Um, but it's really important to uh, assess you know, which uh, threat feed you want to bring into your organization depending on your industry and really uh, um, the goals and how you're going to be using that information. So one really great tool if you want to get your feet wet with threat intelligence is uh, the Collective Intelligence Framework. I have the URL down there, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, it's a really great tool. Um, it was developed um, to simply aggregate various threat intelligence feeds into um, sort of one application. Um, and then you can interact with that through um, uh, an API. Um, one challenge, though, I, I can say is actually setting this up. Um, it is not uh, for the faint of heart. Um, you know, this is something where um, I was lucky enough to have an intern help me out with this because uh, it did take uh, quite a bit of time um, to get this thing uh, running. Um, but I was able to get it working, and uh, I mean, it, it functions great once you get it running. It's, uh, it's great. But um, just, you know, be aware that it is going to take uh, a little bit of time to kind of work through the installation process. And then um, here on the next slide, I'll actually show you an example. So um, there's also a, a plugin that comes with um, for Chrome or Firefox that interacts with my uh, my specific API. So here I'm actually looking up a specific IP address that I saw in one of my honeypots, um, and I'm able to actually get information about it. Um, it was uh, coming from a from China, uh, from a particular host, um, and I'm, as you can see here, I, I'm able to identify that yes, um, this has been seen by other uh, groups, and even has the threat feed on the right hand side there. Um, there's also a confidence level, uh, which is uh, pretty high. Um, so if this is a situation where, you know, maybe I want to uh, look up this IP address, I've seen that 
they've done something malicious in my honeypot. Um, I've also seen that, hey, I looked it up through my, my uh, Collective Intelligence Framework API, um, and I've seen that, yes, this is a malicious IP. Um, then maybe I want to automatically create a signature for my intrusion uh, detection system or IPS um, to actually block that IP address, uh, maybe even um, you know, set up an IP tables on my server to block it, um, which is another great thing about the Collective Intelligence Framework is that um, I can actually export that data um, as specific rules. So I can actually um, have it automatically um, export um, SNORT signature rules or for Bro IDS um, or IP tables or CSV, uh, many other different formats. So it's really easy for me to um, bring in this threat intelligence data and then really make use of it within my organization. And of course, threat intelligence, it's not limited to you know, just IP address and IP reputation, but um, also you want to deal with uh, malware. Um, and actually, Tripwire Enterprise, we recently announced a, a really tight integration with uh, Checkpoint's Threat Cloud, um, where if there are any changes, um, any binaries that are detected, um, it can automatically send that um, into, check, uh, cl into um, sorry, Checkpoint's Threat Cloud um, and actually identify if that particular binary is malicious. Um, it's a really slick integration that we have, um, and we have a lot more integrations that are um, like this on the horizon. Um, so it allows you to sort of take that intelligence that you have internally on your network um, and, sh and actually you know, share that information out and identify if that um, particular file is malicious and if it has been seen before by other uh, folks. So what's really great about threat intelligence nowadays is that it's, it's no longer just about you know, um, identifying um, things after the fact, like in terms of incident response and you know, sort of backtracking the pieces of evidence to identify if this is malicious uh, malware that was installed. Um, but you can actually make use of this information in real time, uh, which I'm really excited about. So um, here's an example of uh, a website that I have actually uh, managed um, where I am actually utilizing threat intelligence data to, to block um, you know, um, anything from a, a suspicious IP address, for example. So um, anything that's coming from a hosting net block, so if it's coming from like an Amazon Web Service uh, um, account or something like that, um, odds are that that is not friendly traffic um, that's targeting me. It's a scanner of some sort. Um, you know, it could be a compromised uh, web application. Um, I also will block anything like that comes from a Tor exit node or um, anything that I can actually detect as um, a search engine bot of some sort, um, you know, something that's not Google. Um, and uh, anything that comes from like a translation proxy such as Google Translate, um, that can also be malicious, so I'm going to block that. Um, and there's a lot of other um, blacklists that are available out there of IPs that are suspicious. Um, and so I integrate those feeds directly into my uh, web server and then um, through Apache I'm able to block those directly. So um, just, a, just an example of, of one way that you can actually use this information. Uh, I think it's particularly useful when we're dealing with um, web applications, um, particularly if you're dealing with e-commerce. Um, there are certain types of traffic you may not actually want on your website. Um, some folks might allow Tor um, on their website if it's a blog or something like that, but um, sometimes if uh, you're doing e-commerce or you're doing banking, something like that, you may not actually want that type of traffic, um, that could be a, a risk indicator for you. So, so with that, um, that's the end of our, our presentation here. Um, we're going to um, now go into a little bit more detail around um, security intelligence and threat intelligence and, and how that all ties together in the next presentation. So hope you guys stick around.